Welcome to the Cosmic Pie Podcast, episode number six. I'm your host, Wayne Barcos, and here with me, as <laughs> always, thankfully, is... Robert Moore. Nice to meet everybody. <laughs> Robert, we are broadcasting live... Well, it beats the alternative. Is dead on arrival. <laughs> now, if you can think now, in the future, the AIs, would they broadcast, like after we pass away, can we train an AI to do our podcast for us? And would anybody ever know if we have the right avatar that's taking our place, you see? It's a good question. In fact, how do you know that we don't have that now and that we're right. not really here? We're actually doing work up in our office. <laughs> and the, we're not really here. These are avatars. And AI yeah, is running yeah. and answering and making you, comments. You know how we know? How do we know? Because we're too silly. <laughs> Programming we're hasn't advanced that far to... <laughs> Programming doesn't understand humor yet. <laughs> now, we are broadcasting from the campus at the University of North Dakota here in Grand Forks, North Dakota. We do have a live chat, so if you'd like to make any comments or any questions or anything like that, please feel free to use that feature. And always, Robert, we have our disclaimer. Our disclaimer, that our, the opinions expressed in this podcast are those of myself and Wayne, not the university, not the College of Arts and Sciences, not the department, so forth and so on, ad infinitum. Not the president of the country? Yeah, yeah, no. The head of the UN? You know, I, the overruler may, of the know, solar system, whoever that. You know, she, maybe we are speaking is. for the UN, I don't know. <laughs> is I don't go that high up. That's the question. Is anybody speaking for the UN? Right. <laughs> and you, the general, right? UN, the general, whatever. Yeah, that general position. secretary or whatever, uh, yeah. the, whatever its uh, position is. Remember, though, the UN is extremely important, Robert. Well, it is. You know, it was designed right. so we'll never have a war again after World War II. And look how well it has functioned. Absolutely. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's for another podcast, right? I, I, I don't know. You yeah, maybe that may be a different one altogether. <laughs> now you know what tomorrow is, Robert. Uh, Wednesday. It is, but what else is it? What's the date? Uh, let's see, February fourteenth. Hmm. Oh, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Now, do you know? And I just found this out yesterday. I'm kind of naive, so it could have been going on for many years now. There is actually an anti-Valentine's Day movement out there. Have you yes, heard about this? I've heard about this, yes. You wanna, what do you think the, why there is such a movement? I, I think it's because there's a lot of disappointed people out there who think, who think, and they may be right, they're a person perfectly fine, so why doesn't anybody want to be with them? Now, Robert, I can understand some people being upset when it comes Valentine's Day. It's almost like you're alone on Christmas Day, and if you celebrate that, of course, and let's say you're an older person, really old, and your spouse has long since passed away, your children have moved on and no longer bother with you or something, right. it can be a very lonely time. You know? It can, yes. Or if you're like, you're single and you've never met anybody who was right, never got married, never had children, and then all of a sudden it's Christmas Day, that's a very lonely time. That's why a lot of people don't like that time of year. Yeah, I mean, it can be very and, depressing. Right? And, and I think Valentine's Day has the same connotations. Oh, it's for lovers and... It's like, that's not the case for a lot of people. Now, we could change the so-called by de facto meaning of Valentine's Day, and we could make it more, should I dare say the word, inclusive. Yeah, we could. And we could do that by just not saying it's Valentine's Day is special for, like, lovers, if you want to use that term. It's special for everyone. It's special for everybody, and it's a way of us to show that we love all humans, all of society, <laughs> so we're yeah. all under one umbrella. So, Robert, I, I don't think you're going to get going that, you know. down that line, Robert, to <laughs> save Valentine's Day. I expect a box of chocolates to be in my mail tomorrow in the university from you, okay? Oh, okay. Just to appreciate that I exist. How's that? Okay. <laughs> okay, anyway. Right. More serious things. Let's move on. So, Robert, yep. we're going to start this week by updating some news that we talked about uh, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And this is regarding what's really an amazing sort of a mission. You don't hear much about it in the news anymore. So a lot of people are not into, you know, the space exploration, especially of Mars. Right. Right. Or not even going to think well, about it. A lot it, of people right? don't see the point. Well, they just forget. You get this whole, it makes news, makes headlines when, when a rover first lands on Mars. And maybe you track it for a day or two to make sure it's going to survive and look at the first images that come back. 
But then after that, you kind of forget about it, right? Right. True. Yep, true. Yeah. So we're going to start this by looking at what's happened to ingenuity. Okay. Now, do you, can you recall for our audience, what is ingenuity? Ingenuity is a small rotor-driven craft that can fly around on the, the, over, over the surface of Mars. Uh, to do this, it has two propellers that spin at 2,700 RPM, and uh, this is compared to a earthbound helicopter, which spins at uh, around 600 RPM. And uh, so it's able to fly around on Mars and was doing so just fine. It was expected to do one to five trips and has instead done like 72, 70 something. 40s, like you yeah. would say. Right? So, to all the people that say NASA can't do anything right, they expected one to five and they got over 70. So, uh, that sounds pretty right to me. So, we got our money's worth. So, we got our money's worth. We're, and then we're some, in free right? baseball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, as we mentioned recently, the ingenuity had a bit of an, an issue, and the issue was somehow, and what's happened, I think, is that the propellers hit the ground, so it was obviously yeah. on an angle when it was it, descending at some point. Yeah, it lost connection, I understand, with communication and... With the rover, yeah, and, perseverance. Uh, uh, crashed. And yeah, essentially. No it didn't crash saying. hard, that it flipped over hard. and break apart, but it landed, but when it landed, I think it landed way too fast. So, right, and at an angle, so an that angle. the props hit the sand. And so the ends of the props were break, broken off, and what happens when that occurs in terms of the functioning ability of the helicopter? Well, the, the problem becomes the, the vanes are now off balance. They're, they're not equally ma equal amounts of mass on each side, and so that tends to make it wobble and jerk and enders flight considerably. I wonder if you could demonstrate that by taking, remember the child's toy, the pinwheel? Mm -hmm. If you could attach like a paper clip or some other object to one of, part of the pinwheel and then try to spin it as smoothly as you've done without adding that extra mass. Well, I will say that most of us have probably experienced it. Think about your tire losing a weight. Right. And yes. how your car right. just suddenly starts jerking all over the place. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. but yeah, you could do experiments like that with pinwheels or uh, just, like I said, tires, bicycle tires or something like that. Spin them up real fast, put a little extra weight in on one point, and it'll sit there and wobble and jerk in you. Yeah, I guess um, I'm thinking about like a demonstration for uh, K-12, mm -hmm. like for, you know, kindergarten students or, you know, yeah. the elementary students. And that would be a good one that, that could demonstrate how it doesn't function once you upset the balancing of it. So what's happening, of course, is that the helicopter no longer can fly. So, Rob, do you want to pull up the first slide? Yep. And we can see, essentially, its final resting place. And that's denoted here by that green arrow. So to the right of the end of the arrow, the head of the arrow, then we can see a dark and shaped object. And that is ingenuity, the helicopter or the drone, if you like, helicopter yeah. drone. The first one ever to land, as far as I know, on any other planet. Right. So it's the first time that any anybody had did this sort of engineering. And of course, nowadays, drone is like this buzzword <laughs> that we hear everywhere. It's almost as popular as AI now, right? Everything right. is AI, everything is drones, you know. We go through this kind of age where different words, you know, are, are overused. Yeah. Do you remember the word synergy? Synergy, oh. Every paragraph you wrote to, it's like a proposal. Synergistic. Synergy had to be there, you know, yeah. somewhere. They were looking for the... the Proactive. Mm. I remember that one being a buzzword for a while. And then eventually it goes away. People get tired of it. Yep. Just, just like disco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, having lived through disco, good. glad it went away. Disco, is that when you say, like, disco's here and disco's there? Uh, and you're dancing? Is that just, the disco dance? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the final resting place. So notice, it's interesting. This, so these are a set of six images that were stitched together from the Perseverance rover. And if you look carefully... The rover, uh, then, when you look at the helicopter, helicopter is actually setting in a small dune field, so field mm -hmm. of dunes, which means that if the rover actually tried to go right up to the helicopter and kind of inspect it, right, give it a little shake or whatever, right, right it might get trapped in some of that sand. So you got to be very careful, you, right? Right. I mean, you got to remember, Mars's atmosphere is very, very, very tenuous, very, very thin. So for it to be blowing this into dunes, we're talking flower size grains we're talking dust so any the rover tried to go into that it would 
sink. Well, you just don't know. That's the right. thing, right? You can get stuck in there, and then that's it. Right. So you don't want to do So it's not worth the hazard of going, going right in up there. into ingenuity. But you can get close, right? And in fact, you can see the foreground here, uh, the way that you still have some room, that Perseverance could crawl a little bit closer, right? Wheel mm -hmm. a little closer to it. And to do maybe and, zoom in on it a little more. And, and I noticed something about this that they yeah. the zoomed up close. This is a false color image. Yes, it is. Yeah, I can tell that because the rocks are blue. Yes, which means they were pro they're probably dark black or something like that, and they're being hit by the blue filter a little more strongly because the cameras on the rover are black and white cameras, and how it makes a color fi picture is by shooting a picture between each of the in the, each of those filters and then stitching those f frames together to get color. Yeah, and the other thing, and the reason for that is because the mineralogy, so the different types of minerals you find on the surface of bars will reflect light in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. And so by using color images, using filters, you can then get a gross view of the meteorology to look for things that maybe that are more interesting than other spots. Right. And it can go there and then it's got the ability... Uh, to drill, like the laser ablation and all these other things on yep. it. And so you want to find good targets for if, that. If you remember a few years back, we saw pictures of the so-called blueberries right. on Mars, yes. which were right. hematite, which anybody who's worn a hematite ring or pendant, it's a black rock. Right. But these were blue, and that's why I'm saying that these rocks that we're seeing, because they're blue, are probably of black or dark brown mineral of some sort. Now, the one thing that comes to mind right away is during the Apollo 17 mission, I remember, mm -hmm. and, it, and the reason I remember, I was watching a documentary just a couple days ago, so it's okay. fresh in my mind, and there was a point where uh, Gene, um, Sharon, uh, Gene, uh, what's his name? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I'm gonna pull I'm bad Harrison at Schmidt, right, and Gene uh, Cernan, that's the two astronauts okay. that walked on the moon on Apollo 17, had come to a place where they discovered orange soil. Oh, right. Do you remember that? I remember that now. I remember hearing about it anyway. And that was something you could see with your eye, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't like you need special camera to look around on the surface or whatever. It was visibly orange compared to the rest of the soil. And that's older rock. Yeah, so it was glass beads from volcanic mm -hmm. activity that occurred billion, like 3.8 3 billion years prior is what right. they determined. But they said it was one of the most amazing finds that they ever discovered. It's not the something they expected. No, not at all. In fact, you'd wonder if we had rover in that area, unless you went to that right spot, right, that you might be able to photograph and pick out that it's something different because of the color difference. You would have, might have missed that completely, right? Right. So that's a, that's a reason to have humans on the surface doing active that's exploration. one of the biggest arguments for it, yes. Is, Although it costs a lot more money and is and, very risky. And, and humans also get curious and go, Let's check out what's behind that boulder. Right. You know, whereas a rover... Oh, you know, no, it's got three legs. It's running towards me. Ah! <laughs> but I will also note that those dunes are not terribly deep. Right. Because you can see that blue color in about the middle of the picture showing through in the trough between two of the dunes. Right. So they're not, they're not terribly deep, but... But you don't want a billion-dollar rover going... But you don't want a billion-dollar rover that's got other things to do getting stuck because you wanted to see your dead helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing about all this now is, we mentioned this also in a prior podcast, that the United States as well as uh, the Europeans and so on are planning the Mars sample return mission. Mm -hmm. In fact, the rover Perseverance, along you know with the helicopter you see here, one of its goals of the rover was to collect samples of rocks and soil put them in a canister and leave that canister on the surface of Mars. It's well marked a location, yep. right? geolocated as we would say today, right? We know how to find <laughs> this stuff. And in the future, we would send down another uh, spacecraft that would land on the surface and use a rover to go to these sites, retrieve these samples, bring it back to a base camp, essentially. And there, there was a, a vehicle that would collect these samples and actually have the capability to lift off the surface of the mm -hmm. Mars, go back into orbit, in Martian orbit, hook up with another spacecraft, and then go, go back towards the Earth. Yep. So we return those samples. And, of course, it's much cheaper and less dangerous to do that with robots, essentially. Than people. Than, than people, right? Right. 
So you don't wanted, have to carry life support. For yeah, the well, I mean, one of the things you like, wouldn't I love to have a rock that's from Mars that's never been affected by the Earth's atmosphere? Because we do have those rocks. They're meteorites have landed mm-hmm. on the surface, especially in Antarctica. We find them more easily. That could be a podcast going over how we know that they're from Mars, those meteorites. Yeah, we had mentioned it slightly a long time ago. The idea yeah. is they're gas bubbles trapped in the side of these meteorites. And when we analyze the composition of the gas, they find it's an exact match to the atmosphere of Mars. Right. And it's definitely not a match to Earth's atmosphere. No. Yes, exactly. Or Venus or somewhere or Venus else. Or and we somewhere, found yeah. rocks that seem to match from Venus, too. Mm-hmm. So it's not like a rare thing. There are, you know... A, a, a huge, let's say even an asteroid impacts Mars. A lot of that debris gets flown up into the space, reaches escape velocity, so it's no longer gravitationally bound to Mars itself. And eventually the Earth then goes through that location where the rocks happens to be, enters the Earth's atmosphere, and if it's large enough, some of it survives. Right. And when we go to Antarctica, it's nothing but an ice sheet anywhere, everywhere. And so you're driving along, you know, on a machine. <laughs> and there's a dark right? rock. And there's a rock sticking up, right? <laughs> it's like, where the heck did that come from? You I'm, see? I'm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it didn't come through a kilometer of ice, though. No. It, so when you analyze it, you, and there's ways of doing it, you find out it's actually a meteorite right? mm-hmm. rather than a meteor wrong, right? It should be <laughs> the, the opposite of that. And yeah, and you can tell that some of these came from Mars. And so that's interesting from that point of view. But, I mean, it's gone through the Earth's atmosphere. It's been weathered. How long was it laying on the Antarctic ice sheet before we discovered it? All of these things. You'd want to have something that's pristine. Something more controlled. Right. So that going to Mars in situ, grabbing these samples directly and bringing them back. In fact, I wouldn't even bring them back to Earth. I'd bring them back to maybe the space station yeah. That's in orbit around the Earth, and analyze it first there before you try to, you know, you contaminate this stuff. You've got to be very careful. That would be a good idea, and a reason for yet another space station. Yeah, know, or since extend the ISS this one. is beginning to show its age. It has, and it's unfortunate because it took so long to build the thing and put right. it up there, and it cost well over $100 billion. And now we're thinking about dumping it into, and, like, the Pacific bef- Ocean. And before anybody gets to freaking out, no, we did not supply that $100 billion. You know, we did part of it, but not all of it. Yeah, well, it came down, if you remember, back in the early 90s, I think it was, or even before. Yeah, I guess it would have been the early 90s where Congress had to make a decision. Fund, completely fund, continue, right, to yeah. supply to full funding for the International Space Station. Or build the superconducting super collider, yep. which will be a topic we may get to at the end of this podcast. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. And of course, you know what the selection was made, right? Which way they went. Yeah. So it'd be nice to have both, but would have been nice to have both. You know, my money is finite. At least, at least in my household, it's finite. Yeah. I don't know about the federal government's. Sometimes it doesn't look like it's too Some, finite. Sometimes it doesn't look like it. Does but it? anyways. <laughs> So moving on, so the other thing, we're talking about, you know, so the helicopter, ingenuity, it's not going to fly again as far as we know. Oh, it's uh, the other thing to mention here is NASA did say that their plans at this moment are to, so the helicopter has its own uh, camera on board, is to move the propellers very slowly and photograph them at every segment or every little motion that they're going to do with the propellers. Right. To get an idea of how they perform when they've been damaged, the end's been broken off essentially. Maybe they'll, if they see everything go smoothly and nothing collides and it's balanced enough, maybe they'll try spinning it. I don't know. Why not, not, right? I I mean, it's it's dead one way or the other. So why not spin it up and see if the balance is off enough? Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's going to be some type of gyroscopic uh, action Mm -hmm. or activity that will try to maintain the balance. Maybe that would be enough to maintain it and they'll fly once again. But as far as we can tell, it's 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 not going to. Right. And. That's, you know, you can cry about it, but that's really proven the technology. And, you oh, know, yeah. future missions, whether they're to Mars or to Titan or other places, we're going to have things like this. Anything that has an atmosphere, we're going to have these drones flying around. Right. You almost guarantee yeah. that's going to happen. And and good. You know, you can cover a lot more ground that way. Yeah. See the, a lot more of the, the surface. Yeah, and if you're interested in the money aspect, it's a heck of a lot cheaper having these unmanned safer these unmanned drones flying around a planet that has at least some part of an atmosphere right. to speak of, rather than humans trying to cover all that territory in the same amount of time. Yep. So that's I will the agree. Thing. I, I will agree. Yeah. So. Now, there's been a lot of discussion lately, and it's 
lately means the last several years, especially with the Starlink satellite system. Uh. So the issue with that is if you put satellites in geostationary orbit, they're what, 22,000 miles up roughly or something like that? In geostationary, yeah, about third of the way to the moon. Yeah. So they're up high enough that they maintain the same orbital period as the rotation period of the Earth. So they're viewable over some part of the equator all the time. So they rotate with the Earth. That's the way to think about it. And that allows you then to bounce signals off the satellite and then the satellite then turns around and retransmits that to a ground station and you can cover a huge area of the Earth. Technically, you can cover most of the Earth with just three of these type of satellites. But of course, you know, you have to do something else if you want to cover fully the, the polar regions and other places. So if you use those type of satellites for internet, it turns out that the latency, so for example, you're typing on your laptop and you're using satellite internet, there's always this sluggishness that one mm -hmm. one uh, experiences. And to minimize that, SpaceX, Elon Musk, uh, got this idea of, well, if you put the satellites in low Earth orbit, so just a couple hundred miles up roughly, you know, three right. or four hundred miles up, depending exactly, then the signal has a lot less distance to travel going up to the satellite and back to the ground station. And that would cut down on some of this latency a little bit, right? A little bit, right? A little bit. You know, light goes really fast, so the signals travel at speed of light. So right. there's not a huge difference from going up three to 400 miles to going up to 22,000 miles in terms of time, right? But it does make a difference, it turns out, when everything is processed through the ground stations. And that's exactly, you know, what you get in terms of pushing a key on your keyboard and then having that then go to another computer, right, that's somewhere else going through the internet and responding. So it can make a difference. Yep. But because the satellites are not in geostationary orbit, their needs, they're moving all the time with respect to the ground. So there needs to be a lot of them. So there needs to be a lot of them. So at any given moment when you're on the internet, you it's like GPS system. You want several of these satellites, and the more the better. Right. You want several of these satellites that's above you that you can see, right? That's mm -hmm. within your local horizon, as you would say. So what, in order to cover most of the globe, you're going to have to put in, put up a lot of these satellites. You're talking thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of these satellites. Well, if you're an astronomer that likes to look at things in the sky when the moon is not up, such as really faint objects, <laughs> like say distant galaxies, if you put a lot of the stuff in space, then chances are that if you take a long exposure image of the night sky, you're going to see trails going through your image due to the reflection of sunlight off from these the satellites. satellites. It's not like the satellites have lights on them, and all you got to do is say, hey, you're ruining astronomy. Elon Musk, please turn off those lights, because who's right. using them? No, it's reflected sunlight. Mm -hmm. And even if you plan, put, paint them black, so they, they still show up, because they're still reflecting a little bit of light. And the problem with that is, is you're deal talking with a telescope, you're talking about a big eye collecting a lot of photons, you're also talking about very sensitive photography instruments with the CCDs and everything. So even that little bit of light still shows up. And the other thing that SpaceX had been experimenting with doing just that, mm -hmm. painting their satellites black, and they, there was some issue I think they found where it absorbed oh, yeah. sunlight a lot more and was overheating, overheating the satellites it. more right. than what they expected. And remember... You don't want to, you know, want to make elaborate, complex system for actively cooling these satellites because that's just going to make each one of them expensive. And bigger. And you have to put up thousands of these. So you want these objects to be as cheap as possible to make yep. it you know, financially efficient, right? Right. To make it the, worthwhile. The problem is, as cold as we talk about space being, uh, the only way that an object in space can, ra can uh, release heat is through radiation which is inherently uh, um, inefficient compared to conduction or convection. Standing on the surface of the moon as an astronaut in the Apollo program, do you remember the, roughly the temperature in the sunlight? Uh, 300 degrees. And in, the sh and in the shadows, which would be behind them relative to the sun, what was the temperature? Minus 300. So like there's that. a huge difference in temperature, whether you're, co you're looking at the surface exposed to sunlight or one that's not directly exposed to sunlight. But half their body wasn't frozen and half of it wasn't overheated, and it was because conduction and convection are able to spread the heat around efficiently through you or through the material of the spacesuit, whereas radiating it 
takes a long time. Yeah, so you need a space suit to walk on yep. them and survive on the moon, besides, you know, the oxygen, the heating effect, too. Right. So the, th- the thing to note here is that these satellites, and it's not just SpaceX. We pick on them because they were first. Right. But there are all <laughs> these other countries with their own system of satellites, mm-hmm. right, that are got the same idea and are starting to put up, th- up things as well. And, you know, if you were uh, some not too friendly of a country and you're using the uh, services of SpaceX, well, what happens if some hostilities break out and they're like, well, we're turning off your access to our satellites that could destroy your ability to perform the duties you need to perform. Right. And so you want your own system, right, that you can control. So you're not reliant on some other country's system, which means instead of putting up 20,000 satellites, now there's 40,000 up there because you need (laughs) your share. So if everybody does that, you're talking about literally hundreds of thousands potentially of satellites in low Earth orbit. Now, people will say, oh, don't worry about it because they fall down, they re-enter, they're in low Earth orbit, it's an orbital decay. Our atmosphere, it's not like you go up so many miles or, or kilometers and all of a sudden you go from an atmosphere to no atmosphere at all. No, it, it spreads, spreads out, diffuses. Out grad- gradually. Yeah. yeah, and that atmosphere, you know, it, it expands and shrinks usually because of solar activity. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more solar activity going on. So what happens? You have you, you receive more energetic energy from particles being emitted from the sun, and that pops out our atmosphere. In fact, that's what brought down Skylab, Skylab. you may recall, yep. in the uh, mid to and late 1970s. Even beyond that, the day side's atmosphere is usually a lot more spread out from the planet than the night side yeah. because of the temperature difference. So there's not this, like, you know, we always say, okay, here's our atmosphere. You make it like a more larger sphere mm-hmm. than the Earth. That's not what the shape of the atmosphere is at all but nope. it's just a simple approximation that allows you to do whatever you're, you're looking at doing but the and the other thing is remember the space shuttle that mm-hmm. one of the early missions of the space shuttle was to go up and boost skylab into a higher orbit right the the shuttle the skylab came down in the late 70s the shuttle first flight wasn't until 1981 april 1981 yep so and the reason for that i think it was is because the sun had gone through a period of solar activity Heightened Which solar activity in a normal... Expanded the atmosphere. Yeah, more than what they thought brought down Skylab a little earlier. Yep. And the other thing is the shuttle was delayed, like all major systems <laughs> like this. So it went up a lot later than what it originally was designed to go up. Yep. And so, you know, putting those two things together means Skylab was brought. And in fact, it's interesting because if you look at movies taken, let's say, available on YouTube, and you see astronauts moving around inside of Skylab and compare them to the International Space Station. To me, it looks like on the International Space Station, they're moving through a broom closet. It's just that broom closet is very long, yep. but it's cluttered. But it's cluttered, In Skylab, yeah. you've got all, you're like in a big gymnasium doing somersaults, you see? It's like they had this huge work area, right? Right. This three-dimensional, cu- this cubic well, volume space, it was, right? It was the first stage of a hull of a uh, Saturn V rocket, and if you've ever seen one of those, they did have plenty of space. Yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> what a way, huge. what a smart idea, right, yeah. to, to build a space station like that. Right, you weren't using them to get to the moon anymore, so why not? Yeah, so it was, in, you know, it was pretty cool. And that comes from the fact, just in case you don't know the history there, is that we, the last Apollo mission to the moon was Apollo 17. So there were plans to do a lot more, and then it was cut back to essentially there was going to be Apollo 18, 19, and 20, and that was going to be the end. But because of even further cutbacks and loss of support, uh, uh, that was the end of 18, 19, and 20. They also canceled those. In right. fact, they even had the Saturn V rockets built to launch those next three Apollo missions to the moon. And I think part of the, I, mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure some of the thing that was involved was what happened to Apollo 13. Right. That the politicians were scared, hey, let's stop this thing before we kill people on a mission, right? right? And end it here where everybody hopefully returns safely from the moon. Especially since we've accomplished what really was about, which was beating the Russians there. Well, as we've seen with the shuttle program, if you keep pushing and pushing missions, eventually right. something is going to happen, unfortunately. Something's going to go wrong. So any, anyways, uh, getting back to this, so there's a, an incredible number of objects that are already in orbit. In fact, just go outside. You don't even have to be in a super dark location and look up just like an, maybe an hour after sun, a couple hours after sunset and a couple hours before sunrise and just watch the sky. And you can see satellites going across all the time. And 
that bears a mentioning of what they look like. They'll look like a dot that is noticeably moving, kind of like an airplane across the sky, except they won't be flashing like an airplane does. And they'll get dim, they'll start out dim, brighten, and then get dimmer again. Now, just to be, to complete that statement, mm -hmm. they will change in brightness over time. They won't flash like an airplane lights, but they will change in brightness up and down, up and down. And that's really because of rotation of the uh, satellite. Right. So more of the light is reflected towards you at one point in time, and then not so much, and then back to you again. So you get this up and down in brightness, but it's not like the flashing of lights of an airplane. We, in fact, used to plot uh, when we were making observations uh, astronomical observations. We'd plot a set of satellites called Iridium uh, because they had big solar panels on them. And if they turned towards you, you got what was called a flare, an Iridium flare. And it just shot the whole frame. <laughs> yeah, and I used to go out and look for those. Like, because mm -hmm. there's websites you can go on um, and, and look for this kind of timing of your location. You put in essentially your latitude and longitude. And they'll say you go out tonight at 3 a.m. and you'll see uh, this flaring event taking place in this location of the sky. Yep. And they're amazing. Some of them can be extremely, extremely bright. bright. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. At first, if you didn't know what it was, it would scare you, wondering what, what this thing was. <laughs> Wonder what that was. Yeah. yeah. UFO. <laughs> Aliens, man, they're on their way. They're letting us know. They're coming right. for us. And it's like, no, no, that was just a satellite. Yeah. Now, speaking about the use of a telescope and all of these satellites that are going to be coming, you know, in the near, in the near future to an orbit near you, <laughs> what this uh, slide is demonstrating is a basically simulation of the different types of satellites that are up there now, plus additional ones that are going to be added. And there's a, a, a telescope that's being constructed now down in Chile, the Vera Rubin telescope, okay. and it's part of this process, this big project called the LSST, Legacy, Legacy Survey of Space and Time, it's called. And the idea is they're going to take this roughly 8.4 meter diameter telescope and image the southern sky completely every, roughly every three nights. Okay. And they'll do that over and over and over and over again for at least 10 years and probably a lot longer, right? Until right. basically you, the telescope no longer functions or you can't afford it or attention's Diverted turn out somewhere right? else. And so the beauty of that is when things are changing with time, like some stars flare up all of a sudden and then they die back down again, if you're imaging the same area of the sky night after night after night essentially, you're going to see these type of objects. So these could be supernovae events and so on mm -hmm. and so forth, right? And so looking at things called transient phenomena is the technical word that we use for this. But really it's going to be supply a huge amounts of data for anybody that's interested, it's going to be available, you know, online. And you can go through all of the, the images or the catalogs that they will generate for you to look through and so on and so forth. And so there's going to be a whole host of scientific results that are come back, everywhere from near space all the way up to the deepest reaches of the cosmos. But the problem related to this is the fact that a lot of time when you take an image, especially of a large area of the sky, which this camera will do, is that you're going to see these streaks all through it due to the satellites passing overhead. And some of those streaks, somebody doesn't want you to know who's there. Yes, so that's <laughs> kind of cool. These are the satellites that supposedly are not on any list of satellites in, that are in space. These are right. the top secret type of satellites that you are not allowed to uh, investigate, hey. let's put it that way. <laughs> but somebody will. Yeah, well... You can't hide what's in space. Why? Because there's nothing to hide behind. Well, that's it. You can take. You can go out and purchase a telescope. Yep. You can go out and purchase a large set of binoculars. You can go out and get all the, your equipment that you can afford and look in the sky. You will see stuff. You can. I mean, amateur astronomers can take telescopes and photograph. You know, for example, space stations that are launched from other countries in detail. Right. And, and, you know, if we can do it, obviously the professionals can do it too, right? And they can see what type of structure. And you can actually see, you know, the type of solar panels that it has, <laughs> the different types of spacecraft or shapes that are, that are docked to the space station and when they leave and when they arrive. So you can basically snoop on the stuff that's in space. Right. It's not just the governments that can do that. We can, you know, the average, the average amateur astronomer can do, can do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's estimated that roughly 10% of the time of this particular telescope is going to be lost due to the fact that 
and you're going to have these bright streaks going through the images. Now, you might say 10% and you still have 90%. What are you complaining about? Well, this project essentially, you know, the cost of building it and getting it going and maintaining it, it's over a billion dollars. Right. So it's like you're talking about 10% of a billion dollars. So what's 10% of a billion dollars? 100 million. Please deposit in that bank account before business day closes today, Robert. No, you no do doubt. That? We're splitting that, right? I'll pay the taxes on it. Yeah, Just give me the 100 million. But we're splitting that, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of money, right? A lot right. of money. And so that's only at the current projected sort of what's happening now and what's happening in the near future. But imagine that companies to say, hey, this is a great thing. It's a money-making adventure. Let's put up 5 million of these satellites. Right. Well, it can get so crowded. And it already starting to be crowded. That if you launch a rocket from the Earth, a manned rocket with people on board that's heading to some far, far destination like Mars, that the chance of your rocket right, of getting hit by one of these satellites as you pass through the low Earth orbit area, region around us, becomes extremely high, then it's game over. We right. can't even launch people then well, beyond the Earth because of that at some point, even, if it continues. Even beyond that, the likelihood is going up and getting higher that one of these satellites is going to collide with another. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of time. And then that collision is going to produce debris that then becomes potential hazardous material too. So, yeah. This is a problem, and people are making light of it, but it's something that needs to be thought about right now. Now, Elon Musk was uh, attacked, if you like, verbally with when this system became, you know, people became aware of what was going to happen, the mm -hmm. Starlink system. And Elon Musk's response was, well, just put your telescopes in space. Why are they on the ground anyways? And they're much better in the space. You can see clear, and you can see light over a much wider range of wavelengths, essentially the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Right. You have the right equipment. And he's, ex he's exactly right. But the problem is this stuff is extremely expensive to put in space. Right. I mean, something like $10,000 per kilogram? Well, think of the James Webb Space Telescope. Right. You know, that's like six and a half meters in diameter. The Hubble is a little over two, about 2.4 meters in diameter. So it is a much improved rock, uh, a telescope, and it observes in the infrared. It doesn't observe in the optical, but the cost is a lot greater for the right. James, James Webb Space Telescope. Like, in order, what, 10 billion instead of 1 billion for Hubble, roughly. Something roughly like that. That order, yeah. right? But so this stuff is extremely expensive, way more so than building a large professional telescope on the ground. Right. And so it's nice to say just put your stuff in space, but hey, that costs a lot of money. And the other thing is, you know, it might maybe get to the point where even just smaller size telescopes that universities can afford and colleges have all these issues constantly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they can't afford to put these telescopes in space, and everybody's vying for time on these large telescopes. How are you going to get all the time that you need? You're right. not. You're not. So I mean, it, yeah. even with the evaporating of funds into the large earthbound telescopes, um, you're having a lot of trouble getting uh, uh, any time on them because it's just a few big ones that are left. I'm going to bring up another issue. Okay. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay. Let's pretend that i am got my hat on of an environmentalist. I'm mm -hmm. wearing the environmentalist hat. And I'm not just focused on the earth environment. Okay. I'm focused on everything. Okay? Okay. What if you're Elon Musk or mm -hmm. someone similar that essentially puts all of this stuff in orbit around the earth, what gives you the right to ruin the night sky for me? I have the money. You see what I'm getting at? Oh, I see what you're getting at. So Absolutely. So it's funny that environmentalists don't jump on this. Right. Because you don't want to ruin the ocean, even though we put pollution. Even though we're doing that pretty You don't well want to ruin people's water, even though we do that. We do that. You mm -hmm. don't want to put garbage like landfills and garbage laying around everywhere on the ground and people can't enjoy the earth. And well, we do that. So. Why do we have the right to pollute space? Right. Affecting my night sky, right? I agree. So I, I, I feel the same way about street lights. Exactly. You know? right. Lights where you don't need to have lights, and there's just right. too many of them. Why does the local car dealership need extremely bright lights? All the time. All night long, and nobody's there. 
Oh, right. they'll get robbed, and the next morning there'll be no cars in the car lot where the day before there were 200 of them. Well, no, because That's... if they really wanted to do that, they're going to do that anyways. Right. And so, so, and you can have a, some amount of light. You just don't need to be lit up like the Super Bowl was going on in the parking lot or something, right? Right. That's the point. And a lot of these lights shine up in the sky. Well, there's no robbers coming in from the sky. I don't see them coming by parachute <laughs> anytime soon. You wouldn't think anyways. Don't, so don't why do they need to shine them. upwards? Right. And I illuminate agree. the I sky. Agree. And that's that reflected light, the energizing of the atoms and molecules in our upper atmosphere that turn around and re-emit that light, right? So scattering... Mm -hmm an emission process that we're encouraging, that all contributes to light pollution. Right. We just don't need it, yet somehow... Somehow don't, we do. Well, somehow people don't realize it's an issue. Right. You know, it's a very small fraction of the population even thinks about, even probably knows what the term light pollution even means, you see? But now you're adding to it with all these satellites. You're polluting the sky. Mm -hmm. And so... A thousand years from now, there might be so much stuff up in the sky, you really can't appreciate it the way right. we could, you know, when we were young, for example, right? I agree. So that, that's one aspect. That's one way of thinking about all of this, mm -hmm. right? And what happens, how we'll all converge at some point, who knows, right? But speaking about the James Webb Space Telescope, right. one of the things the James Webb Space Telescope was designed to do was to look at solar systems mm -hmm. that are in the process of forming. Now, a good target of this will be the object you see here on this slide. This is not this is pretty not an image <laughs> taken from the James Webb Space Telescope. Is this Hubble? This is data that was taken from. So let's look at oh, pan, pan stars. stars. Remember on the ground in Hawaii. Yeah. This is a pan stars image. This is the one, the image that you see on the right, clearly. And what you see here is an edge-on protoplanetary disk. This is a perfect target for the James Webb Space Telescope. Its infrared capability allows it to see light that's trying to get out deep inside of this object. Right. And remember that if light is trapped inside a dusty disk, the light that can get out is preferentially the longer wavelengths can penetrate through that dust debris. The shorter wavelength lights get scattered and absorbed as they can't get out. Plus that dust gets heated up and readmits at infrared, infrared wavelengths. Infrared. Right. So you want to turn the James Webb Space Telescope to this object. So this is a newly found object. We never knew it existed before. In fact, serendipitously, there's a big word of the day for you, Robert. <laughs> it was randomly found in a catalog Taken by IRAS. IRAS. Now, huh. what, do you remember what the IRAS mission was? It was the precursor to James Webb. It was an infrared telescope in space, uh, about a 0.8 meter size mirror. Uh, did a lot of good work. A lot of amazing things were, were found because of it. So. so it was launched in the 1980s by NASA and did mm -hmm. all sky surveyed infrared wavelengths for the first time ever. That's why it found so much. And, and kept on even after it ran out of coolant. So. Spitzer was the follow-up. Oh, Spitzer was the follow-up. what you're thinking of. I'm thinking of Spitzer. Yeah, yes. yeah. But IRAS was Spitzer. the first generation of, of oh. doing all-sky survey from space at infrared mm -hmm. wavelengths. And without the atmosphere, of course, you can see a heck and detect a lot better than you can from ground base, right? Right. So Spitzer found this object as an infrared source, and it was just in a catalog. And what PanStars is, uh, this team then went through and checked from the use of this other ground-based telescope that has optical wavelengths to look at these infrared sources. And this is the one that they discovered. And nobody had bothered checking to see what type of object this actually is. So it is a very large disk. How large is it? Well, the disk itself is on the order of about 978 light years away. Yep. So Robert, if you send your Valentine's Day card and you like digitize it and send it by radio signal, you're going to have to wait 978 years for that signal to make it to this place. And then another 978 for my Valentine to send the message back. And that message would be, forget it, I'm taken. Right. <laughs> See, you wait yep. nearly 2,000 years for that message, right? <sighs> Anyways, this object, given how far away it is, and how do we know how far away is it? Well, stellar parallax, the measurements actually uh, distance is well defined using the Gaia mission. 
Okay. So right. this we talked about that also in the on right. a previous podcast. So this is geometry. This is geometry. Yeah. This is like surveying, right? And looking at some object, some distant object relative to even more distant object from two different vantage points, and looking how that object shifts relative to the distant object. Yep. Very simple demonstration. Everybody do this now. I'm watching you. Take your finger, put it in front of your nose. Close one eye and look at where that finger is relative to the background. Then open that other eye and close the other one and see where it is relative to the background. The same finger at the same location. And then go back and forth. Don't move your finger. And you'll see your finger appears to shift relative to the background. That's and that's parallax. because you're Yeah, that's, that's parallax. And you're viewing it from two different locations from the two different eyes that you have, assuming you have normal vision, of course. Now, we can do the same thing for stars. If, for example, we can observe some star and, and from one location on the orbit of the Earth and then view that same star six months later when we're on the other side of our orbit around the sun and look at that same star and we'll see it shift slightly in position if it's close enough to display the shift. The problem is, and you can also demonstrate this, the further away the object is, the smaller the shift if you keep your observing position the same. same. Yep. And you can tell that, but just take your finger and put it out as far as you can get it with your outstretched arm and do that same kind of demo, looking at it with one eye than the other, and notice the shift is a lot smaller than if the finger is a lot closer to your nose. So this, this object is close enough. We can use stel stellar parallax then to determine roughly its distance, and that's where we get this number of nearly 1,000 light years. Now, with the distance and the size of the disk, and there's a scale here, the length of that arrow that has two arrowheads on either end there, that's horizontal on the bottom left, that angle is 11 arc seconds. Now, what's an arc second, Robert, if you want to explain okay. it for people? Every degree, there's 360 degrees to a circle, and each of those degrees is further divided into 60 uh, arc minutes, and then each of those 60 arc minutes are divided into further into 60 arc seconds. So 11 arc seconds is... Let's see, what would it be? Uh, about 1 360th of a degree. Yeah, you would take 11 and divide it by 3,600. Right. For those of you who want to do that right now, and quickly let us know what that is. <laughs> uh, just, just kidding. But yeah, that would be how many degrees that double arrow is, that horizontal line there. Right. So given the distance of this object, then we can calculate what is the size of the disk. And the disk size, you can see the number that's on the slide in the bottom left. It's 1,650 AU. An AU is an astronomical unit. It's equal to, one AU is the average distance of the Earth from the sun. Mm -hmm. So in miles, what's the average distance from the Earth to the sun? Do you remember that in miles? 93 million. 93 million. So... If you take 93 million, multiply it by 1,650, you will get the size of this disk. It's amazing. It's you think It's huge. I mean, to put it in perspective, from Jupiter to uh, the sun is about 5 AU. So... Well, from the sun to Pluto, if you want to include that as a planet, is it's still a dwarf planet. It's about 40 AU. 40 AU. You're thinking right. about how long it takes to go around once. Yes. 248 years to right. go around the sun once. But it's roughly about 40 AU on average. 40. So this is still much larger than even the orbit of Pluto. <laughs> so this is a very young debris disk that's in the act, as far as we know, ultimately forming maybe some type of solar system or star system, Right. right? Planets, planets, probably multiple planets around the host star. In fact, we know it's young, and one of the reasons why we know it's young is in the middle of the disk, not the bright spot like on either side, but kind of in the middle where the dark lane is between the two, you should see a star. Right. And if there's enough time that has elapsed since the formation of the star, when the object became a real star, and by real, we mean that we have had enough time such that hydrogen is now actively being converted into helium through thermal nuclear fusion. If there has been enough time since that process of fusion has begun, the star has been a main sequence star, as we would say in astronomy, yep. then eventually what happens over time, it clears out of that debris disk away from its vicinity, allowing the optical light to come out from the center region to be viewable. And in this optical image, you cannot see that host star. So right. it must be enshrouded still within that 
protoplanetary disk of material. And, and so in, it must be young. In fact, how young? We know from taking observations of thousands of these types of systems that that disk of debris is generally blown away within 100, 120 million years. So this star is incredibly young. So this is definitely a primary target for follow. If I was in charge of James Webb Space Telescope, this would be on my target list. Oh, absolutely. Because you get oh, some yeah. wonderful, very high resolution in the infrared of this object once we turn the space telescope towards it. And I'm sure the authors of this study or somebody else are doing just that. just that. Yeah, yeah. Are, are waiting for time on this telescope. Um, At least I hope so. I, I mean, I'm sitting here and noticing all kinds of things about it, but I won't take up the rest of our time with that because I'm squeeing. Uh. <laughs> well, you know... It's a lot of times it's interesting when you look in science, right? You see something from one perspective, mm -hmm. you get a very biased view of what's right. really there. In fact, if you look at it differently, you'll see something totally different. Right. Oh, a I classic guess. example of that is the Death Star. Themis. Uh, Themis. <laughs> <laughs> now, when Voyager first flew by Saturn, this is where we got mm -hmm. our first good view of Mimas, one of the moons of Saturn. It was at roughly at the time just after Star Wars had came out. Right. And you could see the image. This is taken from the Cassini mission. I follow up to the Voyager mission. And Voyager was just a flyby. Cassini actually went into orbit around Saturn for many years. But the moon, which is on the right, notice has a very large crater. It's called the William Herschel, the Herschel crater, it's named okay. after him, with a very prominent central peak in the center. And it looks very much like the Death Star in mm -hmm. Star Wars, the original Star Wars movie. Right. So that's why I fumble about that, because we, when we talk about Mimas, even among astronomers, we do. So. And so you might wonder, well, why is this making news today? Well, it's making news today because it's a recent study that's been done that suggests there may be an ocean under the ice in this moon. In fact, it may be on the order of somewhere between maybe... 20 to 30 kilometers below the surface right. that there's actually an ocean. It's amazing when you think about the possibility here. Indeed. Even I though mean, you can't wow. see it when you look on the surface. You see craters everywhere, so it's icy, rocky surface. But they're not... No, so, so you might wonder, okay, well, how in the heck would you be able to tell that there's an ocean so many kilometers under the surface? Now... A good analogy for this, Robert, and, and both of I, you know, to make a confession here, actually talked about this the other day. Right. If I give you an egg mm -hmm. and I ask you, I want you to tell me whether this has been, this is a raw egg or it's hard boiled and you can't splat it on the ground to see or anything like that, <laughs> you're cheating. But is there some physics demo, that's what I'm getting at, Right. a physics demo that you can do that tell if it's liquid inside or not? And the answer is yes. If I take it, set it on a table, and try to spin it, if it spins, it's boiled. It's hard boiled. There is no liquid in the center. Because if it's not hard boiled and it's liquid in the center, the liquid will slosh around and make it wobble, and it won't spin. It'll just kind of flop around. Well, think of inertia, moment of inertia. You're spinning the egg, trying right. to get the interior, which is in liquid state, to go with the outside. You can't, right? There is that, there's frictional forces, of course. So right. there's, there's like delayed reaction, right? So if I spun it for long enough, it would eventually start respond. spinning. Respond. It would, would respond, right. So what's then in this system, Robert, do you remember what's doing this quote unquote spinning analogy here? Um, no, I don't remember. It's going around Saturn and that the nearest approach is actually shifting around Saturn as it goes which means it's wobbling. Right. And so its orbit is changing, and it's changing the way that we would expect if there was an ocean below the surface. Now, does that prove it? No. No. So one of the things you can do, then, is go off and run lots of simulation. You can build a fake moon in a, in a computer program, and you can have it go on its orbit around some other body that would simulate Saturn, for example. And you could look at what impact that has on its orbit, and you can then fine-tune your parameters to say, hey, it surely looks like the fact that this object, this moon, has a subsurface ocean. Other ways you can do it is, of course, you could go out there with a magnetometer, which Cassini had or didn't. I don't think it did, actually. 
But you can go out there with a magnetometer and test the magnetic field because it's going to behave differently around this moon if it's solid than if it has a liquid, especially if it's a salty liquid inside. Now, according to the simulations, it shows that this sort of uh, effect on the orbit it's relatively young. It's only roughly around 25 million years old. You can see that in the abstracts if you read it, which infers that this effect of this ocean then has reached these type of depth, depths that we're seeing here, 20 to 30 kilometers, roughly, you know, in the last two to three million years. And so what the authors are speculating is that is too short of a time for geological features on the surface to give if you like information on what's happening deep inside of the moon right. itself. Unlike Europa around Jupiter. Or right. Some of the IO. Some well, of don't the forget, and yeah, these type of moons have stuff that spews up and geysers, ice right. geysers, so you know there's activity going on in the interior. Or, or Enceladus around yeah. Saturn. Yeah. Right, exactly. And this moon doesn't show that because maybe it's too young yet. So in several million years from now, we will see this type of stuff happening yeah. in this activity. The other way that you know for sure that there's any type of oceans on these objects is to do something that's extremely interesting in the future is to do what, Robert? What do you think we should really do? Let's drill, drill, drill. Drill, baby, drill. Have you heard that before? You know, <laughs> you sent a robot to Mimas and you drill down through the surface until you get down deep enough that you get into the ocean part of it. Right. And that's when you will know 100% certainty, of course. Right. And then we can speculate. Right. If it has an ocean. If it has an ocean, and if it's salty. What's in our ocean? Right. Life forms. Life. Is there any life in the ocean in Mimas? That would be a good question. Being if heated it's... from gravitational tidal perturbations of going around Saturn. Right. So there's enough energy that su can sustain light. Maybe life not as we know it. But we're very biased. We're only on the planet Earth. How, what about all these other different possibilities of life forms? And, and in fact, I, I would find it highly unlikely and highly unusual if the life was like us. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that would be just shocking. So, I mean, even down to having DNA, that would be shocking, surprising. Well, you know, life is really its environment, right? Right. So... Who knows? You know, depending the amount, the type of life that you get, then is due to the environment, the condition in which it mm -hmm. finds itself. The chemicals involved, the chemicals available, all kinds of things. Now you can't predict. You know, one of these things that we've talked about in the past about science communication is not to leave, the, uh, let the public go astray on things that we put out there without clarifying exactly what we're meaning here. And you you can go to various things like on YouTube or whatever, and you can you know someone will say, oh, there's an exoplanet going around this certain certain star that's two thousand light years away, and here is a painting of the planet and some light creatures on <laughs> it, as if they've been there already and you know on a on a tourist vacation and came back right with right. all these pictures, and no, that's speculation obviously. Right. And so we're speculating. And so we're speculating, but we have to let people know that no, that's all fake. That's just a speculation. This. You know, just, just my dreams, I'm showing you right. what it might look on, like on the surface of this object, for example. But life is extremely complex. Mm -hmm. So to try to take environmental factors and be able to predict with any certainty at all what type of life you may have is very difficult. Right. Now, you could get some gross type of features if you knew the composition of the atmosphere. You could say, you know, what type of you know, system they may have for respiratory type of things. You could take the mass of the planet and the size of the planet to understand, well, if the creatures were walking around, they must have a certain strength to be able to maintain, you know, upright positions right. if they were because of the gravitational field environment they're in. Uh, you can't, you know, there's a reason why we don't have creatures as tall as the Empire State Building, for example, walking around the right. surface of the Earth. There's reasons why mountains can't be 200 miles in height from the from sea level up. Right. Right. They just, you know, angle they, of repose. The tensile strength of the material can't mm -hmm. stand the weight of that. Right. In the gravitational environment we find ourselves in here on Earth, and so on and so on. So you make all these, but to get the actual nitty gritty detail, what life forms would be like, and so on and so forth, we can't do that. Nope. We can't do that. But it's nice to speculate. Yeah, it's always nice to dream, Robert. It's nice to dream. It's nice to dream. So, Speaking about dreaming, if yeah. you dreamed of ever becoming a scientist, of wanting to be a physicist or a biologist, in fact, you can put the two together, 
astrobiology. Ooh, that's probably a coming field, folks. It is, very much is. Yeah. Then come here to the University of North Dakota. Don't go anywhere else. We <laughs> love you to come here. Indeed. Now, if you can't come here for whatever reason, then you can take courses online. So long as you got Elon Musk Starlink. Right. So or here's somebody a, else's. Here's an work. advantage to that: the internet, <laughs> having the internet, then you can log on and be able to take these classes as from anywhere you are in the world, essentially. Indeed. So it's very interesting times we live in, Robert, for sure. It is. I, I I love it. I mean, the Chinese use that as a curse. I don't know if it's necessarily a curse anymore. No, well, interesting could be one or the other, right? It's it kind of neutral, right? Yeah. Depending on how things are. And of course, it depends on your life, right? What are the <laughs> things that happen to you personally? There are definitely some things that I wish would be a little less interesting. Well, I can just, I'm just thinking about people always dreamed that back in the 50s was the good old days. Well, that depends exactly who you were and what conditions you found yourself in. Right. Back, the 50s weren't such a good old day for some people, right? Right. That's the thing. So you have to be careful, right, with all that kind of stuff. But anyways, I think yep. we ran out of time for today. Indeed. Our next podcast will be Tuesday, February the 20th, the same time, same great place, as they say. Right. Now, we always leave you with a quote at the end of the day. All right. Who's this one by? Today, I want to try one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. Okay. Cool. Can you can you think of a name? Not the one that we've tried, but had a few quotes before, so... Uh, I would think of Niels Bohr. No, not him. No. Very um, good guess, though. Uh, Schrodinger? No. Erwin? No, oh, somebody else. Early on, near the very beginning. Near the very beginning. Uh, Dirac? No. Planck? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Max Planck. Maxwell Planck. Max Planck. <laughs> one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So Max Planck said, an experiment is a question which science poses to nature. And a measurement is the recording of nature's answer. I like that. That's a good one. Well, if you also like that, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good week, folks.